Hey folks, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about historiography, uh, demystify the process of what historians do um, and how they've done it um, in the recent past. And you know, I think there's, you know, it's a really good quote by Frederick Jackson Turner, a uh, really renowned uh, older historian, um, late 19th, early 20th century. Um, and he said in, in 1891, Turner argued each age tries to form its own conception of the past. Each age writes the history of the past anew uh, with reference to the conditions uppermost in its own time. Uh, this notion, by the way, then, um, and, uh, was and remains relatively controversial, um, especially for people who believe in fixed historical truth, the idea that um, the past um, is a set of things that, or, or, or events that have happened. Um, and, and of course, you know, are there historical facts? Absolutely, right? Um, certain things happen at particular times in the past, or have happened, rather. Um, the interpretation of those facts is precisely what historians do. Um, and there are distinctions uh, there, uh, between the past and history. The past is the past. It is all the things that have occurred before this point. Uh, history, though, is how people reimagine the past. It's a really good quote by uh, James Banner Jr. who's um, on the screen here. I think that it encapsulates this. It, it, he argues, um, he states that history is what people make of the forever gone past. Out of surviving documents and artifacts, human recall, such as items as photographs, films, sound recordings. Indeed, history is created by the application of human thought and imagination to what's left behind. Historical interpretations tend to grow and adjust in some synchrony with the times into which human existence has moved so that previous historians' interpretations are likely to yield new ones, new, more comprehensible, compelling, and relevant to those who are alive. I mean, think of it this way. Can you imagine how people wrote histories of the bubonic plague before the discovery of germ theory? Um, those discoveries, evidence-based discoveries, forced people to go back and reimagine what previous historians had written about the plague. And this is precisely here. What Banner Jr. is talking about is that prompts from the present reshape the ways that people think about not just the past, but also about history. There are any number of untold discoveries on the horizon that at some point are going to change the ways that people write the history of God knows what. Um, and I think this is precisely what this quote is digging into. It's like people need to make sense of the past in, 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 in terms that they can relate to. So ultimately, it's this idea of how powerful narrative is and how narrative and meaning um, are how people make sense of the past. But those have to be done in terms that people can understand. Um, and this is what in some ways gets us to historiography. It is thinking about the cumulative effort of historians to, to interpret the past. It examines changes in methods, interpretations, and conclusions of earlier generations of historians who in some ways were limited um, by the tools that they had available at, to them at the time. And this is a really good depiction here in this photo of, of the process of historiography. It's an artistic interpretation on the writing of history uh, by Jacob DeWitt. And there's history, of course, atop as the naked truth, looking down on the process of writing history. And in many ways, it kind of encapsulates um, the what I was saying earlier about the distinctions between the past and the writing of history. And by the way, I think, I think it's interesting that the wit chose in some ways to depict the past as, as the semi-naked truth. Um, because history obviously is all the study of the ways that historians write history. It seeks to measure the way history as a discipline evolves. Broadly, it is simply the study of the way that historians write history. It is the history of history. And it has evolved, especially in recent years, um, into kind of philosophical uh, 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 distinctions or, or what we might call schools. Historians often use different philosophies to interpret the past. And they use investigative historical philosophies to do this. These philosophies emphasize forces that shape the past. You might emphasize economics or politics or culture. Um, these are just a few examples. They're not the only ones, but you, you get the point. As, and, and when historians do that, they sometimes bunch into schools with a collection of experts that agree in a particular set of forces that might have driven history. 
that it is politics or it is economic determinism, um, that economics or these exchanges between people uh, dictate the ways that human beings have always interacted with one another. So these kinds of philosophies are what historians bring to the table when they're thinking about reimagining the past. And so, so I'm not gonna give you all of them, but there are any number of schools that um, have arisen, uh, that arose rather in, in recent years. One of which is the cyclical schools that history repeats itself, um, that we see cycles in history. And the, the other is the, the, the providential school, that God is the driving engine of, uh, of change and the battles between good and evil uh, drive humanity. We see this, for instance, with the, the, uh, uh, people who were who promoted great man theory in the mid 19th century, namely uh, Thomas Carlyle, that history was driven uh, by great men who had essentially been brought to earth by God to move us forward um, in this kind of linear trajectory toward progress. And it was divine intervention, um, these kinds of epiphanic moments, uh, these aha moments driven by people um, that pushed us forward. And, you know, and I think this in some ways gets us to the progressive school of, of historical uh, imagination. And this is of the belief in a kind of constant, linear, and in fact, secular um, in, uh, uh, kind of driving force behind humanity. Wig history is the kind of cousin of that, is that hu humanity is becoming freer and more enlightened with time. Of course, this emerges out of the Enlightenment and gains traction you know, um, after that, that uh, the kind of, this is the the arc of the universe. This is one of my favorite quotes by MLK: "The moral arc of the universe bends towards justice." Um, that we are becoming more enlightened, and that enlightenment is making us a uh, 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 freer, um, or making humanity freer. Historical materialists um, believe that humanity is driven by struggle between the haves and have-nots, uh, class struggles, in fact. And then there's the new social historians who emerged in the late 20th century. And they make a pretty novel claim in saying that in forgetting everyday people like Thomas Carlyle, the great man theorist did, um, and emphasizing great men, previous historians neglected the real engine of change, which is everyday rank and file people. That everyday rank and file people were the driving force or, um, or were instrumental in um, how human beings may change uh, historically. And what we're doing now in some ways is harvesting the insights of previous generations of historians. Um, there is no dominant school now because we see that each school in recent decades has something valuable to offer. Uh, the inclusion of the new social history, the sophistication of economic history and political history, and the sensitivity of non-material forces in cultural history. We've also witnessed a sharp increase in digital, um, uh, uh, this history that allows people to witness the historiography and history firsthand, that people, uh, history is no longer hidden in elite circles. It's been democratized in a manner that allows people to experience themselves in real time on the internet. Um, there, this can be done through maps, you know, interactive, multi-sensory uh, kinds of, um, of things. This is where we are now in um, trying to reimagine how we think about the past and, and more importantly, how we write history. So in summation, I think events in history change the ways historians write histories. History is fundamentally interpretive. For, I said it earlier, but who knows what? We might find a cure for cancer somewhere in the Amazon rainforest. Would Somebody would have to write. I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm just saying we would have to go back at some point, given those discoveries and reimagine deforestation, right? As such, worldviews, ideals, historical events shape the histories historians construct. Ultimately, the past requires interpretation, and historians employ method, reason, informed intuition in recreating it. These interpretations change over time as new discoveries change the ways that people think about humanity. Thank you.